Hi, everybody. So sorry. <laughs> uh, still all these technical difficulties. It's very fun. Um, hi, welcome to the NGVLA virtual tour. Uh, my name is Summer Ash, and I am the STEAM Education Manager um, here at NRAO, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And Faith, if you could stop screen sharing, I would like to bring on the STEAM Ed team just to introduce you to everyone who will be uh, supporting the webinar today. Sure, so, okay. just, just a moment. Yep, just try yeah. and do. Okay, and then Tyler and Montana, you wanna turn your cameras on? So it's okay, everyone can see all four of us right now. So um, why don't you introduce yourself, Tyler? Oh, you're muted. My, oh my goodness. I think I would figure this out by now. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Tyler. I'm a PhD student here at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and I study super dense, super fast spinning stars called pulsars. I'm also a tour guide. Yes. And Montana, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Montana. I'm a tour guide and also a PhD student here, and I work on cute radio stars. Nice. And Faith. Hi, I'm Faith. I'm the education specialist here at NRAO. So we do um, tours like this and also outreach events at the very large array and at um, other just locally in the community. I'm uh, here in Socorro, New Mexico. Yes, actually, um, all of us, our whole team is based in Socorro, New Mexico. And as such, we just want to remind you that um, high speed internet is not ubiquitous. And so if there's occasionally some technical glitches, please bear with us. Um, but if anything goes seriously wrong that you can't see, please let us know in the chat. Um, and otherwise, submit your questions in the Q&A. And right now, I'm going to throw it to Faith, who is going to take the majority of the introduction and tell us all about the NGVLA. So take it away, Faith. Thanks, Summer. OK, so. Um... So hello, and yes, thanks so much for coming. And so um, before we get started, gonna do a few bits of housekeeping here. So um, first of all, please uh, make sure to, um, here's where the Q&A window is if you need, if you want to ask any questions, but please make sure to keep questions in the Q&A and um, chat. And if you have, again, tech, if we are having technical difficulties, those you can put in the chat and also use that to talk to each other. And um, we will have time to answer your questions later on during the tour, but uh, if we aren't able to answer all of the questions that you have, we do have our online Ask an Astronomer feature. So you can go, um, you, we have the search the archives button that you can hit and see if um, a question similar to yours has already been asked. But if you can't find the question and answer that you're looking for, you can submit uh, your own question. And uh, then hopefully an answer for that will be posted. It's usually posted within a few days. Faith, can I just interrupt you really quick? Sure, um, sure. We're still seeing the very first slide. Hmm, okay. Um, sorry, I'm not sure why it's doing that. Let me try. That's okay, just bear with us, everyone. Um, nothing ever is easy. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. I will, um, I'll stop sharing here and then I'll start sharing my, luckily I'm here with two computers so that we have, if we have technical difficulties with one of them, we can just use the other one. So, um, slideshow. And let's try this. Better? Yes. Awesome. Take it away. All right. So yeah, so this is our Ask an Astronomer page. 
So we, to introduce you a little bit about us, so we are the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and we were founded in the 1950s with the goal of designing and building and operating and maintaining state-of-the-art uh, radio telescopes. We have three major different observatories, and so of course the one that we're going to be talking to you about today is the VLA. And... Um, and we are founded by or funded by the National Science Foundation. So a portion of your tax dollars do go towards paying for the uh, for our observatories for NRAO and the very large array. And so even though we can't have in person visitors right now, we still think it's really important to be able to talk to our visitors about um, about what we do and uh, and the work that we do. So. First of all, to, um, so to, before we get into the NGVLA, we'll talk about um, the past and present of the Very Large Array. So our current version consists of 27 antennas, which are each about uh, 90 feet or 10 stories tall. And the dishes are 82 feet or 25 uh, meters in diameter. And they're arranged in a Y shape, as you can see here, with uh, north, west, and east arms. And it's built on the plains of San Agustin in New Mexico. And um, so we started building it in the 1970s, and we completed and dedicated this project in 1980. And um, so... When we built the VLA at that time, it was a um, state-of-the-art telescope. But as you probably all know, technology gets better and better over time. So by the time we were getting into the 90s, the VLA was starting to fall behind technologically. And so in late 2001, we began a project to upgrade the VLA. And so we took out all of the old hardware that was inside of our antennas and replaced it with new updated hardware. And we replaced our correlator, our supercomputer that compiles all of our data with a much updated version. And we, in terms of uh, bringing the data from the antennas to the correlator, we used to use an analog system of doing so, but we went digital by replacing it with fiber optics cables. And this took uh, a little over 10 years to complete. So we finished it in 2012 and rededicated it as the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array, so slightly renaming it. So it's usually still called the VLA, but if you ever see any mention somewhere of the JVLA, that just refers to this uh, upgraded version of the VLA. But we're already starting to think about what we want to do when the current version of the VLA begins to become outdated as well. And so that is the next generation VLA, um, which is uh, what we hope our, the future of the array will look like. And so uh, the, these it will consist of antennas that are individually smaller than VLA antennas. Most of them will be about 18 meters or 59 feet in diameter. And um, there'd be a small core cluster, as you can see in this picture here, of smaller antennas that are six meters or 20 feet. Um, but we'll have over 250 of them, which would be spread throughout New Mexico and into neighboring states and uh, countries creating a much more powerful telescope. And so this image that you see here is showing what the, the cluster of antennas would look like on different scales. So the lower right picture here is basically what the center, the very center of the array would look like located um, in the same place that the current VLA is located. And then when you zoom out a little bit more, the antennas will make a spiral shape as seen here. And then the top image is the one that's the most zoomed out. So after you have that spiral in the middle, then it sort of becomes uh, less of a, a perfect spiral that you see here and just more generally spread out, goes into Texas, into Arizona, into Mexico. 
And we actually have uh, another one of our telescopes is called the Very Long Baseline Array or VLBA, which has uh, 10 antennas that are scattered across North America. So our hope is that we would put NGVLA antennas at several of these current VLBA stations so that the NGVLA would also be spread across uh, North America. So the purple that you see here in this image is where most of the antennas would be from the slide I showed you previously. Previously. And then um, these yellow dots show where we would have other NGVLA stations as well. And so first, before we can do this, we need to get the money. So technically, this is still in the planning stage and not 100% confirmed yet. So, so far, we've received funding to continue researching and planning for the NGVLA. And we've also gotten money to be able to build a prototype antenna. And that was that's pretty recent, so that's quite exciting as well. And so the NGVLA would take about a decade to build. So if we can get funding, we hope to be able to start building in the mid to late 20s, and then we could finish it in the mid to late 30s. And since we have several guest speakers today who are going to talk more about the NGVLA, I'll let them go into that in a few minutes. So here are just some basic differences between uh, the, the current VLA as we know it now and the NGVLA. So as I mentioned before, there would be many more antennas and they would be um, smaller than the VLA. Currently, all of our VLA antennas are the same size. So all of them are 25 meters. But as I was uh, mentioning before, some of the NGVLA antennas would be the smaller ones and most of them would be larger. So they're not all going to be the same size. And also our current antennas are um, symmetrical by in terms of the dishes, but um, the NGVLA antennas would be asymmetrical. So as um, the picture in the previous slide shows, the reflectors would not be right or the sub reflectors would not be right above the middle of the antennas, but they would be off to the side because the antennas are asymmetrical. And with the current VLA, we move the locations of the antennas. We reconfigure them and put the antennas closer together or further apart. And that allows, gives us the effect of zooming in or zooming out with the array. But with the NG VLA, all of these antennas will stay fixed. So we won't be moving them. They just all stay in the same place. And since we have more of them, there's a little bit, there would be less of a need to move them around than there is right now with the current VLA where we only have 28, which is a, um, a big part of the reason why we move them around. And also the NGVLA would cover um, to over twice the frequency range of the current VLA, which means that we would be, a, we would be looking at more uh, different wavelengths or different uh, types of radio light. And so that will allow us to see more different types of objects and study more than we can with the current VLA. And then, as I mentioned before, the NGVLA, since it's going to be much spread out and much bigger, um, that will also give it a much higher resolution power. So it'll be between 10 and 100 times uh, more powerful, better resolution than the VLA has. And so these are the main science goals of the NGVLA, the um, five things that we're most hoping to accomplish with it. So unveiling the formation of solar system analogs on terrestrial scales, which um, so solar system studies, probing the initial conditions for planetary systems and life with astrochemistry, uh, charting the assembly structure and evolution of galaxies over cosmic time, so a lot of galaxy studies, using pulsars in the galactic center as fundamental tests of gravity, and uh, understanding the formation and evolution of stellar and supermassive black holes in the era of multi-messenger astronomy. So that's like studying the life, of, the life and death of stars. So now I'm going to pass it off to Summer and she's going to show you a video about the NGVLA that will talk more about it. Thanks, Faith. Let me select everything. Okay, here we go. The idea for a next generation VLA was inspired by the VLA itself. 
in the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Northern Chile. Uh, the NRAO, in conjunction with our science community, uh, envisioned the NGVLA as a new large radio interferometer that will open up new discovery space in astronomy. Uh, our idea for this is an instrument that is 10 times the sensitivity and 10 times the spatial resolution of the VLA or ALMA. I am very excited about the data that will come from a next generation VLA. Uh, it will be exquisite in detail, uh, the sensitivity will be unparalleled, and the opportunities that it will open up um, in, in many different science areas um, is really one of the things that excites me most, that this is a very open facility that anyone who has a great science idea can propose for and use, and its flexibility and its versatility enable many more science questions to be addressed than, than what we can think of right now. The next generation VLA has been designed to accomplish five main science goals. But unveiling solar system analogs, probing the initial conditions uh, for life through astrochemistry, charting the assembly structure and evolution of galaxies over cosmic time, perform fundamental tests of gravity, and understand the evolution of black holes. One of the things I work on is measuring the distance to stars and star forming regions, and then measuring their distance and how they move within the star forming regions. Currently, we can only do 20, maybe up to 100 stars in these star forming regions. Star forming regions contain thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stars. With the next generation VLA, we'll be able to study 10,000 stars in these star forming regions, which will help us give definitive answers to major questions in star formation. The NGVLA will be a superb black hole hunting machine, the ultimate black hole hunting machine. The NGVLA's uh, high resolution imaging, combined with its fast mapping capabilities, will enable it to search for radio transients associated with gravitational wave sources, neutrino transients, and optical observatory transients, uh, and identify those with black holes that are involved in violent merger events. Okay, so I hope that gave you a good sense that those static pictures couldn't really communicate of the physical new instrument that we're hoping to build. Um, right now, I'd like to invite onto the webinar our first guest speaker, who is Rab Salina. He is an NGVLA project engineer. Um, and so actually, my first question to you, Rob, is if you could actually explain what that means in terms of your day-to-day -day job on NGVLA right now. Sure. So yeah, as, as project engineer, I'm, I'm basically chief engineer on the project. And so we've got a team of about 20 of us today working on the design. And what I tend to work on a lot is sort of the broad facility concept. So making sure that we really understand the science cases and, and the sort of science NGVLA would do and exactly what sort of facility we would need to support those. And then individual design engineers then take responsibility for pieces of the system and, uh, and, and their subsequent delivery. So uh, a group of engineers would be responsible for the antenna. Another group would be responsible for the receivers. Another one for say the timing system that keeps it all synchronized. And I try and watch for uh, say the interfaces in between, making sure that they all talk to each other correctly. And at the end of the day that they'll do the sort of science that uh, I think Eric will talk to you about here towards the end of the uh, open house day. Um, yeah, actually, so one of my first questions is the fact that it's one of my second questions, actually, but um, so the VLA, you know, has been up and running for 40 years. And so we we hardly ever talk anymore about what it took to get the VLA to become a reality. Yeah. And so this is our hope for the NGVLA that this now will turn into a reality. But how long has it actually been going already? Um, yeah. It depends, it depends who you ask. I would say about six years. And that's because I started about six years ago. So of course, that's my beginning, right? Fair enough. Um, the, it, it, the, the, the history of these projects is because they involve spending you know, significant amounts of taxpayer dollars, you have to be able to justify very clearly the need and the relative value of doing this versus something else. And so there's a prioritization process where every 10 years, 
um, a panel of, of scientists are convened and they look to what the scientific themes are gonna be for the next decade. And then they say, okay, if we wanna do this sort of science, what sort of infrastructure, what sort of facilities do we need to support that science? And that's where a facility like NGBLA comes in. So we started in about 2015 to get ready for this coming um, uh, decadal survey that we're just about to exit right now. So this, this whole process has been going on uh, over the last two years and uh, should conclude this year. And so we'll find out what the priorities are for the astronomical community going forward. And uh, I think the sort of uh, science enabled by the NGBLA will rank quite highly and therefore the NGBLA itself as well. We got all the fingers crossed. Um, one question I'm already getting from a couple of people is what's the difference or advantages um, to the symmetrical versus the asymmetrical primary reflector? Sure, there's, there's a couple things it does. Um, the asymmetric design, while you see the feed arm protruding out in front of the main reflector, it's not actually obscuring the dish. So it's all, it's, it's offset effectively. And so the signal coming from your star or your pulsar or whatever your, your, your source of interest is, go, is completely unblocked on the main reflector. And then it's, connect, it's collected by the receiver. And that does a couple things. It makes the dish much more efficient. So even though it's only 18 meters in diameter, it's actually as efficient as a 25 meter uh, VLA dish. So we're able to make them smaller and, um, and more affordable that way so we can have more. The other thing it does is that you get less um, kind of perturbations in, the, in, in that beam. So having to have your signal go through that structure to get to the reflector on the VLA dish imprints a certain feature or two onto, uh, onto the signal. And you have to correct for that. It's a correctable process, but we can eliminate that need as well. So there's performance advantages as well. Nice. And um, I don't have a good diagram um, handy at the moment, but we the feeds for the uh, VLA are that, those huge feed horns. And we know that NGVLA is going to cover some of those same, well, all of those same frequencies and then some. But those antennas don't look like they have the same giant feed horns. So what's yeah, what the, new technology or what's changed that we can actually make those smaller to still cover the same frequency range? It's, it's related to that offset antenna design. So by moving everything offset, we can then put the feeds very close to the subreflector where they have to be further away from the subreflector on the VLA optics. Oh. And by, by, by putting them closer, they can sort of open up at a wider angle and that in turn makes them smaller. So the, the VLA um, feed that works at say one gigahertz is about eight feet long. And the equivalent on NGVLA is going to be a, a little under two feet long. And wow. so we've made everything much smaller by factors of four or more. And at the same time going up in frequency. So it all fits into a package that's about three feet by three feet by four feet, let's say, which is a much, more compact piece of electronics and, and making it smaller lets us make it cheaper and again have more antennas that way we're trying to be very efficient with, with our use of resources. Um, so in the VLA if you want to service those receivers you actually climb uh, around and then in and up from the bottom um, right. but the NGVLA is going to be slightly different is that yeah, right? So with the offset design, what we'll actually do is we'll, we'll tip the antenna down and the feed arm will be, uh, I believe, two and a half feet off the ground. And so then the technicians will be able to service it from the ground. So no more having to hoist up receivers to the receiver cabin. Um, right, so or even let alone the, the, the apex. Right, to get up for the, uh, for the low frequency receivers at the apex, absolutely. So yeah, hopefully servicing will be more affordable as well and you know, better use of time. And so we can run it with a smaller staff. Again, looking for ways of making the, the next design more efficient. Uh, I think the safety officers will also appreciate that. Yes, no, I'm gonna miss having to, to do fall arrest uh, and harnesses. I enjoyed all of that, but um, you know, times change. Yeah, um, so with so many more antennas and I guess kind of just such a bigger instrument and more powerful instrument, um, this might be preliminary, but do you have an idea, would it take um, more than one operator at a time to sort of manage? The system? We, yeah, we're, we're thinking two. And obviously going from one operator with 28 antennas to two with 263, you know, they're gonna be uh, managing a bit more. And so we're trying to leverage things like machine learning to el eliminate some of the, the current tasks that the, the operator would have to do to be supervising the array 
making sure that each antenna is working correctly and uh, automate a good portion of those processes so that that way they can really focus on queuing up their next observations and, and managing it as opposed to troubleshooting it in real time. Um, with the 28 current antennas, they're all close enough to the control building and to the supercomputer that we are running fiber optics from each of them. And now you're going to have ones that spread, ignoring, ignoring the extra long baselines, but even then you're going to have ones that are on this, you know, major scales of 500 miles or more. Are they also going to have fiber optics? They'll all be fibered in. So we're we're going to build a lot of fiber optic infrastructure in New Mexico as part of NGPLA and, and extending into Arizona and Texas and northern Mexico as well, uh, ignoring those long baseline sites for a moment. And so the, the total fiber optic infrastructure we're going to build and, and then the necessary electronics for it, it's we're going to move enough data that's equivalent to about 20% of global internet traffic today through all of that. And you know, this is going to put that in perspective. That's about the same amount of traffic that goes over the Netflix delivers to people's homes over right. the entire internet. So we basically need to build, you know, a data center equivalent to Netflix um, in New Mexico to collect all the data from the antennas. And so that's going to be yeah, a major upgrade. So our internet should work a whole lot better by then here in Socorro. That's the goal. I feel like maybe we should get Netflix to help sponsor this. <laughs> we'll, we'll make movies with them. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And make new cool movies about the science of the NGPLA. Mm -hmm. um, will um, any of the cryo systems be different or smaller or more advanced um, than the liquid helium pumps we're currently using? We're, we're looking at using liquid helium still. And for, for people who aren't familiar with it, um, the, the receivers, the actual pixels on, on these antennas, you want to supercool them to uh, of order, say, 15 Kelvin. So well below zero and, and, and you know, literally freezing temperatures or near, near, zero, near zero Kelvin. And to do so, we use um, liquid helium and the transition from liquid helium allows us to cool the electronics at that temperature. We're looking to do a very similar kind of concept to the VLA where it's still liquid helium with a refrigerator and a compressor, but we've managed to uh, simplify that down from eight refrigerators on the VLA to two on NGVLA. So again, and this will be part of uh, being able to make the array more green. So that's a significant portion of the electrical uh, load from the array today, the VLA. And so we'll be able to make the VLA antennas about three times more efficient. And that means that things like photovoltaics for running them might be a better balance as well. And so this is all part of trying to, uh, yeah, be kind of the environment of the process. Right. I always forget, but it's such an amazing uh, amount of electricity that the VLA requires. I think our we always estimate that electrical bill is like a million a year or something from Socorro Electric. So and it'll we, be nice. to. It'll still be a lot more than that, but not as much as you might think because of advances in technology. Yeah, it'll be about a factor of three more, but then hopefully most of that could be generated by wind and solar this time around. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, we are going to bring you back later because there are plenty of questions I'm sure that are going to be generated from this. But I want to move to Viviana right now real quick to talk a bit more about the configuration. So we'll see you in a bit, Rob. Hi, Viviana. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why are you so <laughs> No worries. <laughs> um, and so you are an NGVLA research associate, is that correct? That's right, yes. And so what does that sort of mean in your day-to-day -day job? Yeah, so um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher. Um, so these uh, postdoc positions are kind of uh, short term, right, uh, for early uh, uh, scientists, early career scientists to are more experienced. So in my case, what I have been doing uh, is helping to test uh, and refine the performance uh, of the NGVLA reference design uh, that as you guys uh, showed previously is uh, composed of 263 antennas. Uh, so what I have been doing is pretty much studying where to put those antennas and what is the effect that will have moving these antennas on the images that we want to reconstruct. 
So that's part of the work that I have been doing. Um, I also work on evaluating the imaging performance uh, through uh, simulations, for instance, using the positions of the antennas or input models of the sources that we wish uh, that that we would like to observe with the GVLA, and in that way, uh, making sure that the instrument is going to uh, meet all the requirements. Uh, that the science community uh, have gave us, right? Um, what else? Uh, in, in, in radio astronomy, we, we, do a, we, we spend a fair amount of time doing imaging processing also. So part of what I'm doing is to find um, the imaging parameters that um, are going to, again, meet the requirements that we have uh, for all the scientific cases that we want to study. So that's part of the work that I am doing. Also, I am providing uh, tools to the community to do their own simulations, to perform their own simulations, uh, to see how their favorite object will look like if they use the NGBLA, for instance. So that's, that's part of the work that, that I have been doing. Um, so just going back to just the, the plain layout of the antennas, the configuration, um, how did it kind of converge into the design that we sort of present now as what the proposed configuration is going to be? Were there lots of different ideas um, that kind of had to be evaluated by some of the techniques that you're mentioning? Yeah, definitely. And uh, what we have right now, what you presented, we call it the reference design, but that is not set on stone yet. We are still kind of uh, iterating uh, a little bit on that. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, overall, each of the, the group of antennas that we have, that we call subarrays, um, each of them, uh, we, we are getting to, to a point where we are actually happy uh, because we are meeting uh, the, the requirements such as the, the resolution, the, the, well, the sensitivity with the amount of antennas in each of those so, uh, subarrays. So um, yeah, it's, it, we are still uh, like tweaking around, but um, yeah, it, uh, the, the simulations really help uh, with, with refining these things. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail but still for those of us that don't use radio imaging processing software, how you're doing these simulations or sort of how this works to, to, to be able to tell if the NGVLA configuration that we're proposing will be able to see and detect and the, the things, the objects that we wanna see at the right amount of resolution. Yeah, right. So for instance, um, let's say that we want to image, um, one of the scientific cases that we have that is uh, to be able to see uh, planets uh, forming, right? Uh, like zooming in in these protoplanetary disks that we see with ALMA, but zooming in to see the actual uh, orbital motion of these planets. So to do that, uh, what we the, the first thing that we that we need to have is a model. So these scientists uh, that are proposing to study this this type of uh, of science uh, developed their model. They provide that to us, and uh, what we do is to take uh, to analyze like requirements like at what frequency they need uh, to observe uh, those uh, objects, um, what level of detail they need. So we, we know that if, it's, if they need a very detailed, very high resolution um, images, well, we need then a configuration that have extended uh, baselines or antennas that are located at, at large distances. Um, and we use those um, configurations of antennas, and we um, well run all the the the, um, the imaging uh, part that has a lot of uh, mathematical algorithms involved uh, within that. Right, um, and you bring up a good point. I think we normally cover this when we talk about the VLA, but we didn't really emphasize the effect of the difference between clumping the antennas together and spreading them apart. 
So essentially it's functioning like a zoom lens. Um, my, my graduate advisor used to say big is small, small is big. So bigger spread on the ground means you can see smaller detail on the sky and smaller spread on the ground means you can see big, bigger structures on the sky. Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct, and that's that's part of what uh, why we have these different um, uh, subarrays, right? So, um, so yeah, it's uh, we need to take into account several of these uh, inputs from the scientist, and based on that, we we run uh, our algorithms. To see, like, if we uh, if we are detecting, if we can detect the sources, for instance, if we can re if we can resolve or, or see, like, the, the 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 fine detail of these structures, uh, or for large scale uh, sources, if we actually can uh, recover the 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 luminosity, the brightness uh, uh, the, of that source. So all those things we need to take into account when selecting the arrays or the sub uh, uh, arrays of antennas that, that we want to uh, use for those cases. Um, another uh, thing is that because we're going up to higher and higher frequencies than the VLA, um, does the models, the models ever take into account like the weather patterns here in Socorro? Um, only because I know that, uh, you know, we tend to get, well, it's baby monsoons, but you know, a bit of a, a rainy thunderstorm season. And those are the conditions that can affect the higher frequency observations. So now if we're going twice as high, are we gonna have twice as much trouble kind of uh, completing those types of observations? That's an excellent question, actually. And at the moment in the simulations, we're trying to incorporate those type of um, what we call uh, errors uh, that that could uh, be introduced in the calibration uh, of the of the data, um, but yeah, I believe that part of the work that that right now uh, within the group uh, we have been doing is exactly that: how to do the calibration, how to remove those uh, those errors in, in our data there's, um, in order to, to have good fidelity images. Um, so that's a work that, right. is, that is still uh, ongoing. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I mean, we still have time. <laughs> um, and the subarrays that we were talking about, you know, the central cluster, but even the, the smaller antennas at the very center, plus the big spiral arms, can you talk more about how, what a subarray kind of is? Because for the most part, the VLA is usually all 27 antennas all the time, even though under special circumstances or requests, we can use just some of the antennas or just some of the frequencies. But it seems like the NGVLA will have like infinite possibilities on that front. Well, um, in principle, I think that we are we could be limited uh, by the correlator, which is like this supercomputer where we combine the signals from each of the antennas, right? But um, I believe that in our requirements, we have a, a minimum, at least a minimum of ten uh, subarrays that we want to use. So this is 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 amazing because it's like having 10 telescopes, right? So where we can run different uh, scientific cases concurrently at the same time. Uh, so again, it depends of the specifics of the science cases that, that you are going to work because some of them will require the sensitivity of more, more, more antennas, for instance. Uh, but in principle, that's actually a, a part of the job that I am doing and is um, choosing the best uh, array or the best uh, group of antennas that it will be more efficient in terms of the sensitivity that we will have, uh, the amount of time that it will require to observe for each of the scientific cases. So what we are trying to do with these different subarrays is, again, we have a, 
a, a, a, an instrument that is non-reconfigurable. We're not going to be moving the antennas like with the VLA where we have the luxury right to change the resolutions. With this one, we have one instrument that needs to cover a huge range of resolutions, pretty much to see all the different science cases that the community uh, would like uh, to, to study, right? So we need flexibility in that case, and we need also be efficient. So that's why we are trying to do this, this type of sub arrays. And, try, and, and part of the work that we are doing is to see which of these arrays will be more efficient for each of the specific science cases that have been proposed uh, at least to, uh, to date uh, by the scientific community. Right. Um, will the all will it have the capability to observe with all 263 at once? Or do we not know that yet because the correlator hasn't been developed yet? <laughs> I think that uh, it is possible. Um, but uh, the situation is that scientifically, uh, it's not that efficient to 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 do it for 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 most of the scientific cases. So it might need you. You really need to um, make sure to to prove that you need all those antennas and that is efficient to do it uh, with all those antennas at the same time. But yeah, the, it is possible. Right. Um, do you know, do, do we plan to contract out the correlator um, and have someone outside build that for us? Or is it um, something that we're planning to do in-house? Uh, I think that that's a better question for Rob, but I think that uh, Canada is one of the partners uh, that- Right, like with our current one. That, I think so, but Rob can maybe uh, double yeah. check. Um, well, actually, that's perfect timing because I think it's about uh, we got about 15 minutes left or just over. So I think it'd be great to bring Rob back on and we can also bring in um, an extra guest that we have, Eric Murphy, who is the project scientist and we'll bring Faith back. So hi, Eric, I'm going to ask you just really quick the question that I asked um, Viviana and Rob first is, um, what is your role on the NGVLA project? And so what are you kind of doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure, <laughs> so I'm, yes, um, I am the project scientist uh, for the NGVLA. So uh, my day-to-day -day, uh, uh, largely consists of um, working with the community to, to, well, to build a science case for the project. So in doing that and, and, and coming up with the, these key science goals that have already been mentioned, in turn, there are requirements associated to achieve those science goals. So it's largely been my job to capture these science requirements, which then get translated to Rob as the, as the NGVLA project engineer to turn those into system requirements to figure out how to build a facility um, and, and achieve those, those science requirements. So that, that is a, that is a largely what I've, I've, I'm doing. And th those science requirements evolve. I mean, science isn't static. Uh, what, what's exciting and new, uh, it, it changes all the time. So we're constantly trying to hone our science cases and just make sure things are sharp. And any tweaks we make is, is you know, Rob's aware of it. So we can make, make sure that the, uh, the facility can accommodate any such changes. Very cool. So before I throw it open to the questions that we've been accumulating, Rob, I don't want to leave anyone hanging. So what's the story with the correlator? <laughs> yeah, we, I think the short answer is we haven't decided yet. We're working with both our Canadian colleagues who provided the correlator for the VLA, um, as well as the NRAO Central Development Laboratory in Charlottesville, Virginia. And they're, they're basically developing uh, competing designs. And uh, at some point, we'll have to have the, uh, the, the shootout between them and decide which one is going to be the better one. So um, that's, that's probably about a year away still at this point. That's also fantastic foreshadowing because um, as Faith will say at the end of this tour, our next virtual tour is gonna feature CDM. There we go, perfect. Um, Faith, what are some good questions that we've racked up? Okay, so we have two here that are um, kind of related. One is asking, given the huge area involved, won't RFI be a pain? And then um, there was another one um, where it's like, will the prolific proliferation of commercial satellites orbiting the Earth affect the NGVLA? 
I guess I'll, I'll take a shot at it. it, it counterintuitively, the large area actually helps. So interferometers with these kind of array telescopes like this um, have an ability to filter out signals that are not common to all antennas. So if you have an antenna 100 miles away from another, they're seeing slightly different RFI or they're receiving it at slightly different times from uh, say those commercial satellites. And so you can filter it out in signal processing. And so the extent of the array actually helps. Uh, and then as far as the, the satellite constellations go, we've been spending a lot of time making sure that we understand exactly how they operate, the, the sort of possible impact they could have on the, the telescope, and basically trying to minimize it as much as possible. We think at this point we'll be able to actually observe in all the frequency ranges that say the Starlink constellation currently uses, and maybe lose somewhere in the vicinity of about 3% of observing time to them. There's some risk in this, we have to do a lot of testing and the VLA it turns out is gonna be a perfect instrument for doing that. But um, we think we can manage it, I think is the key, the, the key takeaway here. Awesome. Um, so at what point will the VLA and the VLBA merge together? Or will they? Eric, do you want to take that one? You're muted. Sorry, sorry. I, 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 I missed that because I was typing in a response to one of the other ones. It, sorry, <laughs> go for it. What was it again? Um, at what point will the VLA and VLBA merge or will they merge? Oh well, yeah, the, the 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 plan going forward is to yeah make make it a single telescope. So um, we, there was already talk about subarraying uh, by Viviana. So that would be one of the modes of subarraying where the continental scale baselines could work with a, a fraction of the uh, antennas on the plains of San Agustin and be carrying out sort of long long baseline science, this VLBA-like science, while the rest of their array is doing so, something else. And everything would be fibered up so it would be real time. At least that's the goal. Um, so yeah, that, that's the plan going forward for that. Um, and before we move on, Eric, could you, men could you address um, what that means for the VLA antennas? Actually, what are our plans for the VLA antennas? Um, tag sale. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I mean, in all honesty, that that is an uh, an open question. I mean, you know, um, they are forty plus years old. They still work well, but they you know take a lot of you know tender love and care to keep them working as well as they do. Um, so it's really actually up to the National Science Foundation. They're the owners of the dishes. Um, so what happens to them is is going to be up to them. Uh, uh, you know, ultimately. Right, but they will be removed, so they won't be. Yeah, they, they will not be the in, the, in the current design, they are not uh, yeah, used, yeah. that is correct. Um, and then someone actually had submitted that question and then they had another one adding on to it. What's the reasoning behind the arrangement pattern of the dishes in the new array? Oh, it's a Viviana question. Uh, that, that is an excellent question, actually. Uh, why are the antennas uh, in the way that they are, right? So um, through many tests, uh, it has been uh, shown that one of the more, uh, the better configurations is actually something that is kind of random, like in the core, right? But uh, with these uh, uh, configurations and with the amount of antennas that we have, we need again to have a flexible instrument and we need to make kind of, uh, it's a trade-off uh, pretty much between cost and performance. So for the core, we have uh, uh, this random uh, configuration that offers us very good, uh, what we call UV coverage or a, a good sampling, right? Now for the spirals, um, which are going in the planes where we have at the moment the, v, the, the, the VLA antennas, um, well, that, that configuration also help us with the sampling that we want to have a uniform time of a, a type of a sampling or UV coverage. Um, but also is uh, easier to run, I believe, the, the fiber uh, in that way, right? Rather than having all these antennas all around. 
Um, and same situation with the mid baselines that we have that are also in this like three arm spiral. So it's, it's, it's kind of a trade off that that's kind of the, the, the short answer. It's a trade off between the cost and the performance. Okay, um, we have another question here. Uh, what does what discovery does Eric hope to make with the NGVLA? And have you thought about a first light image NGVLA? Oh, geez. I wonder who asked that question. Um, <laughs> uh, gosh. I mean, it, it's tough because I'm so immersed in like the full, you know, broad science case. And I'm so excited for all these other things that aren't like my specialty. So, you know, I work on galaxies, but uh, I'm so excited to see what the NGVLA does for, for detecting terrestrial scale planets. So I, I actually think maybe I'll just change fields and become a, a planet formation scientist so I can do that. So, so that, that is the thing I think I'm, I'm most excited to see, um, you know, to, to see how well we actually do detect these things. Um, and then there was a second part. What was that again? That was? Oh, first, um, is first light image. Oh, first light image. That is a great question. Will you um, actually summarize what a first light image oh, sorry. is? So, so a first light image would be the first astronomical object that the telescope takes once, uh, you know, certain observing modes have passed tests and are available to be used. We'll go and take these uh, images. We actually, we have what, what's going to be called first look science in our uh, operate or, um, yeah, operations plan right now, which is we will take a series of objects to commission these observing modes, and then the data will just become public for anybody to do science with them. So in, in reality, I think we'll largely have a community driven uh, process in determining what these first light images are. But uh, if I were to pick one, I would pick, because uh, I do galaxies, M51, the Whirlpool galaxy. That's what I would do. That's a, that's a sharp one. That's a great one. Yeah, well, you can um, look it up. <laughs> and just following up on that, so, but once, once it starts um, being open to the community and people are proposing and getting awarded times, will it run similar to the VLA where there's one year proprietary time period on the data? And yeah, I mean, cur currently we're planning, I mean, the, yeah, current, current plans is to have a similar process, which is pretty much what every other observatory does. One year yeah. for, for projects. And then anyone can access it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Great. Okay, how do you manage the timing of observations between large geographic distances? Yeah, I guess I guess I'll take a shot at that one. It's it's one of the key technologies actually is figuring out how to synchronize all the antennas, because you've got a signal coming from a distant galaxy that might be hundreds of millions of light years away, right? And then it arrives at the antennas, and the idea that you can know precisely when it arrives is what allows you to reconstruct the image. And so what we actually have to do is distribute a timing signal to all the antennas. And we do that from a central location out to the antennas that are, go out to a distance of about 500 miles. And so they'll all be synchronized to one another. And then for antennas that are outside that range, we use what are called active hydrogen masers. And these are very special clocks that people like um, uh, the National Institute of, of Timing use to figure out actually the time at any given point in the day. And we use those clocks to kind of freewheel and tell us the time over the course of a few hours. And then we actually check it with the array. We can actually figure out time with the array. It's one of the key, key products we can get from it. So yeah, a, a difficult problem, but an interesting challenge we find with arrays like this. That's really cool because last time we talked about the VLBA and how that also was involved in measuring precise locations. Yes. So knowing the time and knowing where things are, you can kind of know one or the other. And so if you can figure out one, you can figure out the other. Yeah. And much like the VLBA, um, NGVLA will be used to figure out the Earth's position very precisely. And it turns out this is part of making things like the GPS constellation work at its highest precision. And so we expect to continue doing work with the U.S. Naval Observatory, just like the VLBA does today with NGVLA, but at a higher precision. Very cool. Uh, will there be blind spots by having the antennas in a fixed position? Viviana, you want to take that? Well, um, 
And with, with the VLA and the location of the, of the VLA, we have access to about 72% of the sky. Uh, so that uh, I believe is, is not gonna change. Uh, by no moving the, the antennas. The fact that we can uh, reconfigure antennas is only uh, changing the, 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 the resolution um, aspect. So then um, astronomers who are wanting to observe things that are out of too far south for the NGBLA to see would have to use observatories in the Southern hemisphere, like ALMA or SKA. Okay, for if they want uh, similar uh, frequencies than NGVLA. Cool. Yeah, we have have time for a couple more questions here. So, will sky surveys like VLAS, um, the VLA Sky Survey, be practical with NGVLA? You want me to take that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, um, <clears throat> they can be done. I think that's the short answer. I mean, it's something that we could accommodate. It's nothing that rose up as a high, you know, high science priority. And to be quite honest, the, the telescope is not being built for these sort of large area kind of surveys. Um, that's actually something the SKA is is built being built for and good at, and that's why they use smaller dishes. So by using smaller dishes, the area that you see in any given pointing is larger on the sky. You know, we use slightly larger dishes. And um, all of our optics is shaped. We're really built to, you know, uh, do detailed studies of astrophysical sources, go very deep, and get a lot of angular resolution. But we could do it. And then, uh, does the elevation of the antennas have any effect on the observations? Yeah the 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 higher up you put them, the better they are for high frequency observations. And so this is one of the reasons why the ALMA array, which works from you know, roughly 100 gigahertz up to terahertz frequencies, is located up in the Atacama Desert. It's, it's, it's high altitude, thin atmosphere, and dry. Um, if you get down towards sea level, you've got a lot more atmosphere to look through and a lot more moisture. And so you're limited more towards lower frequencies. So it turns out if you wanted to find a big dispersed area with its hundreds of miles across, relatively radio quiet, that's suitable for say 100 gigahertz observations like the NGVLA, um, the high plains of New Mexico are quite ideal and are actually a little unique in that respect. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Can you pick a fun one, Faith, or anything, your choice? All right, let's see. Wow, we've had a lot more <laughs> come in just uh, in the past few minutes. Um, let's see, will, uh, I think that one we've already mentioned before. Um, with the long baseline, is there more influence of RFI from cities or Earth-based transmitters? Viviana, do you wanna? Uh, I, I think that you, you will be better on that one. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the long baseline sites are actually um, kind of naturally protected. You'll see RFI in the single antenna but you won't, but the, the signal processor will actually remove it. And so um, that works quite well, but we do try very hard to pick sites where there's sort of natural shielding. So uh, mountains in the way, for example, between us and a city, or uh, we'll also look for things like where the cell phone towers are. So Viviana will pick a location for an antenna based on the scientific performance. And then um, some of us on the engineering side will say, well, Where's, where's a nearest cell phone tower? Do we have to worry about that? And we'll, we'll take those into account in the very final placement of where an antenna goes. Um, and I think uh, if I remember correctly, at least the FCC and the NSF, and there is some sort of international RFI community that's really working on how to best share the spectrum um, across all of these different uses, especially the more advances in technology that we get in our daily lives to how to balance that with the needs for science. Exactly right. Yeah, and, and also within the group, uh, we are also working actively in developing algorithms where uh, we can take care of these RFIs uh, also after the observations. So we have all those fronts uh, covered. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, I want to thank all three of you so much for your time today on a Saturday. Very much appreciated. Um, 
And I'm going to throw it back to Faith, who's going to um, wrap up and tell you about what's coming up next week. Thanks, Summer. So, yep, as um, as we mentioned earlier, our next tour, our April tour, is going to be about our Central Development Laboratory, or CDL, which is located in Charlottesville, Virginia, and that's where um, we make a lot of the technology that we need to keep our various observatories running, and this is uh, it's vital for upgrading the telescopes and helping there with their continued evolution. So um, if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, you should join us uh, April 24th, which is also a Saturday, and that will again be at 1 p.m. Uh, Mountain Daylight Time. And uh, so, yes, thank you again to uh, Viviana, Rob, and Eric for their time today. And if you'd like to learn more about the NGVLA, you can go to our public website for it. And that has um, more information that might answer any additional questions you may have. If, if your question wasn't answered today, or if you think of something you want to know later, you can visit this website. So thanks everyone so much for coming and have a great rest of your day.